So it's my pleasure to uh, welcome everyone here for the Warren and Anita Menchel Lecture in Foreign American Policy, which will be delivered today by Bob Cohen, who is a beloved colleague from uh, many members of the uh, government department and certainly a member of the broader community here from all the years that he taught at Princeton. So I'm Michelle Lamont, I'm a professor of sociology in African and African American studies, and I'm also the director of the Weatherhead Center uh, for International Affairs. I started two years ago, and it is a, a great honor and a pleasure to uh, welcome you today to this uh, lecture. Um, and to introduce you to Bob Cohen, I will not reintroduce uh, Joe and I, since he was introduced a few minutes ago by Beth uh, Simmons. First, I'll say a few words on what is uh, this uh, uh, Warren and Anita Manchel lecture. It is one of the five uh, endowed lectures of the Weatherhead Center for International Affairs. It was uh, established at the center in 1993 uh, by the members of the Manchel family and by many of his friends. And it stands as a memorial to the Manchel's long-standing commitment to public affairs and their desire to advance a greater understanding of international relations in the United States. So the lecture series honors Warren Manchel's role as a founder of both the Public Interest and Foreign Policy Journal and his service as an ambassador to Denmark and his deep involvement over many years in the work of the center. So the lectureship also serves to honor his wife, Anita Manchel, who was Warren's full partner and enthusiastic uh, supporter in these endeavors, which he often acknowledged. Unfortunately, they're unable to be with us today, but they very much hope they will have been able to join us. So this is the 14th Manchel lecture, and uh, Professor Cohen is preceded by many very distinguished uh, scholars and uh, policy makers. And uh, for instance, in 1996, the lecture was delivered by Richard Holbrook, a former Assistant Secretary of State and US Ambassador to the UN. In 2000, uh, Jorge Castañeda, former Secretary of Foreign Relations of Mexico, in 2007, we had the most uh, reverend uh, Desmond Tutu, Archbishop Emeritus of Cape Town, and the 1984 Nobel Peace Prize. In 2012, our own Anne-Marie Slaughter, currently president and CEO of the New, American, uh, the New America Foundation and the former dean of Princeton's Woodrow Wilson School, and in 2013, Jean-Paul Trichet, a former president of the European uh, Central Bank. So this year, as part as the celebration of Joe Nye, we honor Bob Cohen, uh, Joe's close collaborator, and Joe Nye will offer a response. So a few uh, words on Bob Cohen. So he is a professor of international affairs and uh, Woodrow, at the Woodrow Wilson uh, School at, of Public and International uh, Affairs at Princeton since 2005. Previously, he was the Stanfield Professor of International Peace here at Harvard from 1985 to 1996. He was also James B. Duke Professor at Duke University from 1996 to 2005, and he also has taught in the past at Swarthmore, Stanford, and Brandeis. So as we all know, he's a most influential international relations scholar, a teacher, and a leader who played a central role in building the fields of international political economy and international institutions. He has a great many books. I will simply mention a few, co-authored several of them with Joe Nye. Transnational Relations and World Politics in 1972, Power and Interdependence, uh, 1977, third edition, 2001, both co-authored with Joe. Also co-editor with Joe Nye and Stanley Hoffman, After the Cold War. Co-authored with Gary King and Sidney Verba, Designing Social Inquiry, which is, was certainly a milestone. And two other important books, After Hegemony, Cooperation and Discord in the World Political Economy in 84, and Power and Governance in a Partially Globalized World in 2002. So several books that truly 
defined his field of international relations. He's had a great many honors, including uh, he's a for formerly president of the International Studies Association and the American Political Science Association. And he's also a member of the American Academy of Arts and Science, of the American Philosophy so Philosophical Society, and the National Academy of Science. I could go on and on, but I will stop. Um, he, his eventual lecture is titled International Institution in an Era of Populism, Nationalism, and Diffusion of Power. As I mentioned, uh, Joe Nye will respond, and before turning uh, giving him the microphone. I want to thank again uh, Susan Farr and Jorge uh, Dominguez. Uh, earlier, uh, Brian here described this uh, occasion as a canonization, so I'm uh, particularly <laughs> <laughs> grateful to them for organizing this canonization, which is already absolutely remarkable. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. Uh, it's an honor to uh, going to give the Manchel Lecture in honor of Joseph Nye, whom I've known for almost half a century. It'll be half a century, Joe, next month. Uh, <laughs> we, met, we met in Berkeley, though, not in Cambridge. We were graduate students together, and Harvard being what it is, we never met as graduate students at Harvard. Um, but I'm going to, and it's also a pleasure to see friends, many, many friends in the audience. Uh, I will therefore begin, uh, I'll begin with a, with a few remarks about Joe. Uh, be, before focusing on my major theme. And I've changed it a little bit. I've sharpened the theme a little bit from the announced talk, which was when I was asked a month ago or two months ago what the title should be. I'm going to talk about populism and the American century. Uh, I'm going to focus it much more on Joe's claim that the American century uh, is going to, going to continue. Uh, now, this may not be Joe's claim anymore after the recent <laughs> event, but we, we, we will see what his claim is after I spoke. Uh, Joe is a master of globalization. <laughs> it seems to me that whenever I get an email from Joe, he's somewhere in Asia, Tokyo, Beijing, or Delhi. And of course, he's always talking to people at the highest levels there, unlike some of us. Uh, his wisdom is sought everywhere. And it's no wonder that he's iconic at the Kennedy School, a great thinker who has access to the highest levels of government uh, around the world. Long ago, I joked that Joe Nye only gets jet lag when he stays in Cambridge. <laughs> <laughs> But jutting around the world is not central to Joe's identity. In some respects, he's a, a peasant at heart, gradually expanding his 18th and 19th century farm, which is now forest in Sandwich, New Hampshire. In other respects, he's a woodsman. Let him take you on a hike around his property after the snow has just fallen. He will show you evidence of nature red in tooth and claw, not soft power at all, that you would probably not have noticed and could not have interpreted on your own. But I'm not celebrating Joe's um, peasant instincts or woodmanship tonight, so that I'm celebrating him as an analyst of world politics and offering him a challenge to which he'll, he'll have an opportunity to respond. Joe's global status is not based on political maneuvering or trendy yet superficial discussions of world affairs, but on solid intellectual accomplishments. He was an early, early pioneer in, in pointing out the changes that were taking place in, in state-centered world politics. Uh, 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 throughout his career, he's emphasized both the relevance of power to state and non-state behavior in, in an era of, of globalization or, or complex interdependence, as we called it a long time ago, and the very nuanced aspects of what we call power. In his most sustained discussion of power, the future of power, uh, 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 published in, in 2011, Joe defines relational power as the ability to affect others in a particular domain and therefore to achieve one's preferred outcomes. The word ability implies the other principal conceptualization of power as resources rather than, rather than relationships. And Joe uses the resource characterization in, in analyzing American power in his works like, like the book on the American century. And I'm going to do that all, also today, although recognizing that, of course, the relational aspect of power is equally or more important. In this talk, I will revisit a question that Joe has asked in his work over the last 25 years. Is the American century over? Joe has given this question a, a consistently negative answer, and has recently, with, in a book with this title, extended his expected time frame uh, for the American century to 2041. Before reaching uh, well, this conclusion, Joe directly addressed the question that seems central to me, 
Will its internal cultural and political divisions decisively weaken the United States in world politics? He pointed out, quote, that culture wars could adversely affect American power if citizens become so distracted or divided by domestic battles over social and cultural issues that the United States loses the capacity to act collectively in foreign policy, unquote. But in his answer, he claimed that, quote, past culture battles over slavery, prohibition, McCarthyism, and civil rights were more serious than any of today's issues. He did not expect disruption of American power as a result of internal social divisions. Joe's answer seemed more plausible in 2015 than it does today, in light of the recent election in, 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 in the United States. Perhaps he agrees. We will soon see. At any rate, my rather gloomy thesis uh, of this afternoon is that we are moving toward a world in, in, in which American power will decline in a process accelerated by, by the election of Donald Trump. The American century will soon, I claim, be over. With this prospect in mind, I'll, I'll conclude by asking about the role of multilateral institutions after American hegemony. Since I'm as stunned as anyone by the events of uh, recent months, I don't claim to provide definitive answers. I hope to stimulate our conversation uh, about the dramatic and disturbing political changes taking place in the world. I'll first briefly discuss populism, since populism seems to me to be shifting the contours of, of contemporary world politics. I will then assess likely shifts in American power as a result of, of Trump's election, arguing that for the first time we can glimpse the end uh, uh, ahead of us of American hegemony. At the end, I'll briefly reflect on the role of multilateral institutions after the American century is over. So what do I mean by populism? The crucial uh, identifying mark of populism, as I define it following my colleague Jan, Jan Werner Mueller, is the belief of people comprising the populist movement that there is an authentic people whose ability to shape their own destiny politically is obstructed by self-serving elites manipulating complex political institutions. Such a belief makes these people receptive to emerging political leaders who claim on the left or the right, there's left-wing populism and right-wing populism, to represent the authentic voice of the people. These leaders claim either that they listen to the people or intuit their views. And then they serve as an amplifier, sharing these views with others. In Huey Long's day, the medium was radio. For Donald Trump, it is Twitter. Social media are wonderful tools for populists, since they bypass elite gatekeepers and, and enable populist leaders to speak directly to their followers. The populist leader is in direct contact with the people and is therefore authentic, whatever his or her other characteristics. Attacks on Donald Trump or, or Marine Le Pen only make such leaders seem more authentic to their followers, proving that malign elites oppose them. Indeed, there's a, there's a danger that populism will become anti-pluralistic, turning against institutions that seem to thwart the popular will. Democracy to populists means fo following the will of the people even if that will challenge long-maintained practices and even rights. When, when Erdogan in, in Turkey imprisons hundreds of journalists, maybe thousands by now, merely for criticizing his regime, he claims to do so in the interest of the real people of Turkey, his followers, not in the interest of an abstract ideology, such as socialism or communism, or simply to assure a continuation of his authoritarian rule. So populism is opposed, therefore, to cosmopolitanism and globalization. That's why I'm focusing on populism right now. Uh, the Prime Minister of, of the UK was playing a populist in her country when she declared this year that anyone who claims to be a citizen of the world is a citizen of nowhere. Populism is generally a, a, opposed to immigration since it views the people as a people with a common language who have long inhab inhabited a, a territory and have therefore traditionally constituted the nation. It is clear that in Europe and the United States right now, uh, populism is, fuel, is, is fueled by by fears of immigration. Strikingly, Japan, which experiences little immigration, does not have a populist movement. Unlike Nazism and fascism, populism is not necessarily militarily aggressive. Uh, Mueller points to Venezuela under, under Chavez as a populist regime that was not aggressive. In the recent campaign for presidency, it, it was Donald Trump who accused his opponent of, of being too aggressive militarily, uh, uh, supporting the Libya uh, invasion, the, the 2000 uh, and three attack on Iraq, advocating a no-fly zone in Syria, and refusing to work more effectively with President Putin of Russia. Populism is a contested concept. I don't claim to be providing an authoritative definition. 
But now you know what I mean when I claim that, it's, that, that populism is a threat to global interdependence and multilateral institutions, that is, a threat to globalization. One of the ironies of populism challenge to globalization is that on a worldwide basis, globalization has been an equalizing force. People in formerly poor countries that open themselves to the outside world, most notably China and India, have been its, big, its biggest beneficiaries. Global inequality has fallen dramatically in, in, in the last two decades. If there were a world polity with elections and people voted according to their economic interests, the, glo the global governors would have good odds of being reelected. But inequality has increased in the West. Working class people engaged in manufacturing industries in the developed countries of, of the OECD have seen their income stagnate and their future prospects dim. How much of this effect is due to, due to uh, a technological change as opposed to globalization is not entirely clear. But from a political standpoint, this is not important. The stagnation and retrogression of income and status are. One way to view our current situation is to view it through Karl Marx's insights about modes of production. Marx thought that all modes of production eventually generate contradictions that destroy the superstructures that rest on them. He expected that capitalism would be destroyed um, by a revolutionary working class that it brought into being. This expectation was wrong. But we can interpret current populist opposition to globalization as suggesting that another contradiction has appeared. Well, this is the contradiction between the enormous force of productivity unleashed by global capitalism on the one hand and the losses suffered by masses of people in democracies on the other. Uh, this contradiction would not pose such a, a systemic problem except for the fact that the losers have the capacity to vote against the, uh, against the operation of the system, which they see having, as having been manipulated by elites at their expense. So voters in Wisconsin and Michigan and uh, North Carolina and Pennsylvania are much more important than if there were voters in China and India. Those of us who have, have celebrated as well as analyzed globalization share some responsibility for the rise of populism. We demonstrated that an institutional infrastructure was needed to facilitate globalization, but this infrastructure was constructed by and for economic elites. They pursued a path of action favored by academics such as Joe and myself, building multilateral institutions to promote cooperation, but they built these, these institutions in a biased way. Global finance and global business had a privileged status, and there was little regard for the interests of ordinary workers. World Trade Organization rules emphasize openness and discourage measures to create what, what John Ruggie has called embedded liberalism, which would cushion the effects of globalization on those disadvantaged by it. The multilateral and bilateral investment treaties of, of the 1990s incorporated provisions that could be exploited by corporate lawyers to oppose health and safety regulations by developing countries that parallel long-standing measures by OECD countries. Most outrageous, of course, was the campaign by Philip Morris to use the provisions of bilateral investment treaties to sue against health warnings on cigarette packages, suits, suits that this company has, has so far fortunately lost. We did not pay enough attention as global capitalism hijacked complex interdependence. There were multiple actors and multiple channels of contact, but overwhelmingly these were business actors, and their connections ran both to each other and with governments. Ordinary people were left out. It will be evident to this audience uh, that, uh, that my analysis, which is now completed, of, of populism is, is quite superficial. I only discuss it since, in, in my interpretation, the rise of populism is likely to have profound effects on American power. We do need a more serious and research-based analysis of populism in political science since we do not fully understand how the combination of social media, large-scale, immigration and economic imbalances and inequality produced by globalization have come together in this which is brew. Let us hope that the Weatherford Center for International Affairs will be a leader in generating <laughs> such research. Now I turn to my principal question in this talk. In the light of American populism, is the American century over? Joe and I made his first striking entry into the the debate on American power in 1990, as he's mentioned before in, in this afternoon, in, in response to, uh, to Paul Kennedy's book on the rise and fall of the great powers. In Bound to Lead, Joe argued that, 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 quote, American leadership is likely to, to continue well into the next century. He was right about that. Kennedy's forecast of American decline may have sold more books at the end of, of the 1980s, but Joe was the clear winner in this debate. 
But as I said at the outset of this talk, it seems to me that the likely answer to this question has changed. None of us anticipated Donald Trump and the rise of populism in America, and we now have to revise our forecasts. Joe focused in the future of power on three forms of power, military power, economic power, and soft power. Each gets a chapter. I agree that military power, economic power, and soft power are all important, and we, and we had a, a symposium on soft power just now. As I noted earlier, I, I will focus here on, on the resources uh, on which a, attempts to exercise power rely. I, I'm going to add two categories to Joe's, internal coherence and sense of social purpose and what I call network centrality. Military and power uh, and economic power depend on material and organizational advantages, which confer on, on their possessors the ability to affect outcomes. They depend on what one has. Joe defines the, the, the source of soft power as the attractiveness of one's society and values to others, which can, can contribute to uh, persuasiveness and the ability to elicit, quote, positive attraction in order to obtain, uh, obtain preferred outcomes. That is, soft power is conferred by what one is. Internal coherence and sense of social purpose also concerns what one is, but our focus in deploying these concepts is on a country's internal situation, uh, situation rather than how it, it projects itself out of the world and affects audiences outside. <coughs> um, uh, internal coherence and sense of, of, of social purpose profoundly condition the willingness and ability of countries to act coherently in foreign policy. Think, for example, of, of the defeat of France in, in 1940 much less the result of inferior material resources than of a collapse in internal coherence. And finally, network centrality means being at the center of the international regimes that govern globalization that therefore, and therefore being a rule maker instead of a rule taker in world politics. This form of power is conferred by where one is. I will ask, what are the implications for each of these sources of American power of populism, not only in the United States but elsewhere? In making this assessment, I will begin with some contentions about power shifts that appear to me to be occurring independently of populism, and then move to a, 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 a preliminary and tentative assessment of the impact of populism and the prospective effects of a Trump presidency. If one only looked at the material position of, of the United States and its principal rivals for power in, in world politics, China and Russia, Power shifts would appear to be relatively modest. China is growing more rapidly than the U.S., but it has economic problems now. It's less asymmetrically dependent on the U.S. than it was one or two decades ago. But, but, but Russia is, is facing economic stagnation, if not decline. America's European and Japanese allies are, are doing less well in the United States, which would marginally weaken the American position. Recently, and especially the last year, we observed more striking changes in internal coherence and sense of social purpose. During the 1990s, Russia lost both coherence and such a sense of social purpose. In the same, de in the same decade, China's uh, Communist Party was seeking to regain both coherence and social purpose in the, w in the wake of Tiananmen Square. It appears that un un under Putin, Russia now has regained internal coherence around his nationalist and authoritarian vision. China's economic success, bringing hundreds of millions of people out of poverty, has helped the Communist Party both to regain legitimacy and to support a more ambitious foreign policy. China's One Belt, One Road initiative and its efforts to, to secure dominance of the South China Sea are the foreign policy expressions for our time of China's vision of itself as a center of greater Asian politics. Until very recently, Europe had a clear sense of coherence and social purpose toward a more perfect union. Immigration and the populist reaction to it have fundamentally changed the situation. Brexit is accompanied by the rapid rise of anti-EU populism, not only in Eastern Europe, but in France and Italy, formerly stalwarts of European integration, and of which Joe has long been a student. These populists are much more willing uh, than proponents of a strong EU to make accommodations with Russia that eschews attempts to foster liberal democracy in Ukraine and other countries that were historically part of Russia. These changes are the result of widespread populism, and it appears of similar forces to those that propelled Donald J. Trump to the American presidency or, or presidency elect. They are not the results of Trump's election. So adverse shifts away from the American century, I think, were already underway before November 8th. Now I, tur I, I turn to the Trump effect. My core argument is that on balance, 
far from making America great again, Trump's proposals will damage some key sources of American power, and in particular the source of power that Joe's work has helped us understand. This analysis may therefore lead us, and perhaps Joe, to reassess his forecast about the durability of the American century. Let's begin with military power. Trump has promised to expand funding for the American military, but the American military is already the strongest in the world. We know that force does not necessarily generate power. The shadow of force can generate power if its wielder pursues a, a sustainable policy in a credible and, and, and consistent way, as the United States did in Europe uh, 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 during the Cold War. That is, credible and consistent policy is a power resource essential for directing force. Credibility and, and consistency, though, are not the hallmarks of Donald Trump's approach to policy. If you've missed that, somehow you've, you've missed the last <laughs> six months. Um, in, instead, he seems to thrive on unpredictability, enjoying generating uncertainty. A President Trump would almost certainly speak loudly, but how he will act is difficult to predict. However, he does not seem uh, prepared or able to develop strategies that translate U.S. command of military force into effective American power. The effect of Trump... Uh, the administration on American economic power is harder to evaluate. Trump's proposed fiscal stimulus may generate faster economic growth and capital inflows. Trump's America is likely to become even more central to financial networks as a result of Brexit, which may drive finance away from the city of London and reinforce the position of New York. If Donald Trump's tough trade bargaining with China and Mexico enhances American bargaining power with other states, his administration could help on the margin to revive U.S. Industrial capacity as well, although these measures are unlikely to have strong systemic effects. On the other hand, the termination of TPP will reduce U.S. influence in East Asia, as Professor Kong pointed out in his comments earlier today. Uh, Trump's tax and regulatory policies uh, could generate capital inflows uh, and a corresponding increase in, in the trade deficit. Uh, or as huge projected deficits could, could uh, uh, generate inflation and a subsequent recession in response to anti-inflationary monetary tightening. As Joe has pointed out, immigration is a source of, of American economic strength, so constraining immigration will have a negative effect. Macroeconomic forecasting is not reliable in a turbulent world, so my net evaluation of the, of the impact of Trump's election for American economic power is ambiguous. It's not all, at all clear to me which way it goes. When we turn to soft power, the picture darkens, as David Welch emphasized in his symposium remarks. Populism at, at, at home will damage U.S. soft power by reducing the, the attractiveness of, of, of American society and the ideals that it represents. A movement that came to power by bashing foreigners, criticizing American alliances, and opposing trade and, and immigration can hardly expect to appeal to people in most of, of, of the rest of the world. Trump's opposition to the Paris Climate Accord exemplifies his dismissive attitude so far toward the view of others. He's already been warned by no less than China and Saudi Arabia not to renege on the agreement. Indeed, it seems to me that China is positioning itself to be a soft power leader on climate change, as well as promotion of, of, of trade openness. They have learned from Joe's trips to Beijing. <laughs> American ethnic diversity is also a soft power strength. We look more like many other countries than we would were we a, a country dominated by, by white people which the U.S. was before the Immigration Act of 1965 and the civil rights and black power movements. Donald Trump's populism cannot reverse this diversity, but is setting itself up in opposition to it and seeking to slow down America's demographic shifts by resisting and, and, and restricting immigration. As I noted, uh, these restrictions will have economic costs and therefore implications for economic power, but I think its major impact on U.S. power will be on American soft power. And judging from Joe's discussion of immigration in, in, in the future of power, he agrees. An America that rejected diversity would be less appealing to the rest of the world and less persuasive to others. Now I move to the two dimensions which are not in Joe's set of canonical uh, economic, military, and soft power dimensions. The first one he's, he, he talks about in, in the future of power, he doesn't give it the kind of prominence I think he might have given it. That is, network centrality. As he says in that book, Centrality in, in networks can be a source of power. In my view, it's even more important than his, his, his analysis suggests. What Susan Strange called structural power is best exemplified by network centrality. Uh, I, th I hope that in Joe's next brilliant book, we're going to see lots more coming, it's given a, a more prominent position. In, in, in the short run, we may observe an increase in U.S. Fi financial centrality as a result of Trump's 
deregulatory policies and the impact of Brexit. But uh, on the whole, uh, network centrality is a major dimension of power. Being at the center of a set of networks which, which you can, if not manipulate, at, at least manage and adjust to. Uh, being a, a Network centrality has been a major dimension of American power over the last 70 years, uh, and its decline under populism would reinforce the negative implications of populism for American power. Uh, throughout the last 70 years, basically Joe's in my working lifetime, a little more than that, uh, the ability of the United States to, to achieve its purposes has been vastly enhanced by its leadership in multilateral organizations, including the United Nations, the World Trade Organization, uh, uh, the World Bank, and the IMF. Our core values and, and interests are embedded in scores of international regimes. When the United States priorities changed at the beginning uh, and end uh, of the Cold War and, and in the wake of 9-11, the U.S. could use and reorient these institutions because they played crucial roles in international cooperation and the United States was central to them. If a Trump presidency devalues American participation in multilateral institutions, American power will decline. Uh, we can see evidence of the importance of network centrality from China's response to the, um, uh, uh, the prospect of a Trump presidency. During the last month, China has moved swiftly to exert leadership on climate change policy and on trade. Expectations that, that, that a, a Trump administration could oppose the Paris Agreement have led the Chinese to make more and more explicit statements about its importance, implicitly asserting their willingness to take leadership if the United States pulls back. Even more clearly, the, uh, the Chinese push for a broad free trade area in, in the Pacific and the OBOR, the One Belt, One Road Initiative, uh, has gained momentum with the prospective tr uh, collapse of the Trans-Pacific Partnership after the election. Since economics and security are linked tightly, a further erosion of the U.S. strategic position in the South China Sea, uh, already weakened before the election, can be expected. It seems to me that China's recent initiatives, including the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, the AIIB, uh, and One Belt, One Road, indicate that it aspires not to world dominance, but to network centrality. A world in which China was the core of major world networks would be profoundly different than the world in, in which Joe's generation and mine has worked. My fifth and final dimension of power refers to a society's coherence and sense of social purpose. I believe that most members of the American elite have taken coherence and, and, and sense of purpose for granted since the Second World War. Internally, America was seen as becoming more coherent as a result of, of the civil rights movement and its extension to other disadvantaged groups, such as women. Eventually, the United States had a mission to protect the, full, uh, 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 the free world during the Cold War, then to advance human rights and democracy worldwide. The contrast during the 1990s between American and European sense of mission and the lack of social purpose in Russia and, and, and China is, in retrospect, striking. As, as Robert Putnam has shown, um, America's social coherence has been in decline for 40 years. In 2016, populism uh, has shattered what remained of this social coherence by removing cosmopolitan elites from governmental power. It has therefore seriously jeopardized the American sense of mission in the world. No longer does the United States hold an advantage over its rivals on the basis of internal coherence and sense of social purpose. Chinese and Russian coherence have risen, while that of the United States and that of Europe have fallen. If the policies that Donald J. Trump proclaimed during his campaign, which he seems to be pursuing in, in the last month, are indeed carried out, we can expect a decline in American power. Lack of a sophisticated strategy to convert force to power will nullify any gains from increased force capacity as a result of increases in military spending. Any temporary gains in economic power will be outweighed by rapid erosion of our soft power, a continued decline in our social coherence, and challenges to our network centrality. If a negative power shift indeed takes place, we will understand better the intangible sources of power, which are crucially important but overlooked by people whose conceptualization of, uh, of power is cruder than Joe's. American network centrality, and therefore American power, soft and hard, has rested on a foundation of internal coherence and sense of purpose. Internal assets only maintain if we keep making investments in them. It is these intangible assets, as well as more tangible economic and military assets, on which the American century has relied. <clears throat> a less coherent and less purposeful uh, United States will have less soft power and network centrality, and will therefore relegate itself to a less powerful position in the world. We will then, then be looking back 10, 20 years from now, 
uh, not in a full American century, but at the American three-quarters century, uh, almost exactly as long as my life, since I was born in 1941, the year that Henry Luce proclaimed the American century. As we look back, we will see better than we see now that American power rests on what we are and where we are, not merely on what we have, yet it may be impossible to recapture what has been lost. Once again, the Isle of Minerva will fly at dusk. Now I have a few, uh, a few remarks on multilateral institutions after the American century. Joe and I have spent our careers studying multilateral institutions, formal international organizations, international regimes, and informal organizations. We have done so in the context of the American century, or partial century. We've taken it for granted. A background condition for our analyses has been American hegemony. We have pointed out how, how international institutions help states to cooperate under, under conditions of, of complex interdependence, and how the United States' presence at the center of these institutions has served American interests. The United States leadership in multilateral institutions ha um, has shaped these institutions, and the institutions have facilitated the mutual adjustment of American and other countries' policies. And they've cushioned some huge mistakes that the United States has made, including the wars in Vietnam and Iraq. In this lecture, I have suggested that we are now moving into a very different world, one in which the United States will no longer be hegemonic in the sense that it has the capacity to make and enforce rules that are generally followed throughout most of the global political economy. Other powerful states may be the key rule makers in certain geographical areas or on certain issues. The exercise of U.S. power through global institutions will be less important. I want to ask, in inclusion then, what role multilateral institutions will have in such a, in such a world. We would not expect such institutions to be as comprehensive or as coherent as the major post-war economic institutions, the IMF, the World Bank, and WTO. There will be more contestation within these organizations and greater inclinations toward exit, creating new development banks or regional trading arrangements. Uh, there will be less emphasis on human rights. Global regimes will, will, will continue to fragment into what we now call regime complexes, with diverse and overlapping institutional arrangements setting rules in the same issue area. Coherent rules will become harder to make and to enforce. Political scientists will become less obsessed with compliance and non-compliance with international rules because there will be fewer rules to comply with and less prospect of compliance. The unresolved question in my mind is whether the core functions of multilateral institutions to promote cooperation through, uh, through reducing uncertainty and transaction costs will remain valid in a more fragmented world, lacking strong American leadership. In such a world, the United States will have to adjust more to others' preferences, unless it wants even further to lose influence and relevance. Multilateral institutions could retain their relevance uh, more as locales for mutual adjustment, like the Concert of Europe, and less as sites of joint decision-making. Westphalian so sovereignty will be less challenged. There will be fewer external authority structures imposed by multilateralism or domestic societies. As a result, interdependence will be harder to manage. More conflicts will occur over it. And in some areas of human life, such as trade, it will probably decline. In a world without the possibility of warfare, contagious disease, or the likelihood of highly damaging climate change, we could perhaps be sanguine about declines in our ability to regulate economic interdependence and therefore to sustain it. For rich societies in which technology is rapidly advancing, some efficiency losses could be quite bearable. Unfortunately, war remains possible. So the uncertainty resisting uh, uh, or reducing tasks of multilateral institutions will, in a more fragmented world, become even more important than in the recent past. It will also be essential to maintain uh, uh, some capacity of these organizations for joint policy making in areas where the consequences of unregulated human action are especially malign, such as disease and climate change. So we cannot uh, contemplate their decline with equanimity. One of the many threats of contemporary populism is that will not only constrain multilateral institutions, this seems inevitable but undermine them. An urgent task for, for the next generation of scholars and practitioners of world politics is to figure out how, within the context of nationalism, populism, and increasing power fragmentation, multilateral institutions can reconfigure themselves to retain their relevance and their, and their capacity for promoting human welfare. Here is another task for the Weatherhead Center for International Affairs. As they undertake this difficult task, this next generation of scholars and practitioners, will find valuable conceptual resources in the work of Joseph S. Nye. They can also find inspiration in his career. Joe has combined analytic or originality and, and, and conceptual sophistication 
with a clear understanding of how to think and write about policy issues in accessible and politically relevant ways. The author of the concept of soft power is an exemplar for the next generation as well as for those of us in his own. Thank you for listening. Now it's Joe's turn to respond. These uplifting words, Joe, the floor is yours. Well, as Bob said, I've been learning from him for 50 years, and that continues. Uh, I thought that was terrific, and it raised a lot of very good questions. And uh, I wish I had the answers. I don't. But um, let me start with Bob's proposition uh, that the American century will soon be over. He's not the only person who says this. It's actually becoming... Uh, quite a popular statement. Let me read to you from the Financial Times. Uh, I tore this out on November 28th by Edward Luce. And what Luce says uh, is, Mr. Trump will not reverse American decline. The chances are really we will drastically accelerate it. Uh, it would be hard to overstate the epical significance of Mr. Trump's election. The U.S.-led international order as we know it for 70 years is over. The era of great power politics is back, and a view in Russia led by strongman Putin and an increasingly confident China led by the strongman Xi Jinping will deal with a wounded America led by strongman Trump, and the long-run trajectory is towards China. So uh, you have good company. Um, I read his column after I, I read the talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, I agree with part of it, but not all of it. Um, I said in the, in the panel uh, before this on soft power that I think American soft power has declined. And if you ask me to make a prediction, uh, next year it'll, be even, it'll have declined even further if we take one, some of these indices that uh, are problematic, but nonetheless uh, rough indices. So I don't disagree with that. Um, but I think there's a danger of overinterpreting the 2016 election. Um, remember, Trump did not win the popular vote in the 2016 election. He won by 100,000 votes in three Rust Belt states. And if you look at the Chicago poll of uh, Chicago Council on Foreign Relations poll, the majority of Americans still want an outward looking policy. They still do believe that globalization is good for the U.S., and a majority of Americans think that immigration is good for the U.S. So I would argue that Trump's 2016 victory was a brilliant tactical ploy on the populism that Bob described. And that populism has two sets of roots. One is economic, the people who've lost their jobs to runaway plants and so forth, but it's also cultural. And the cultural dimension of it is the status loss of older, white, less educated males. And that, I think, to my mind, is more important than the economic. I think the, the, that's the culture wars that, we, that uh, Bob referred to. And I think if you look at that, it's not clear that populism is going to increase. The population as a whole is not getting older. It's not getting whiter. It's not getting more male. And in that sense, I'm not clear that populism is the wave of the future. I think that uh, you can make an opposite case on that. But anyway, let's, we're, this is not about populism, but about the implications of it. To go back to Bob's uh, characterization of my description of power, you can think of power as resources or power as behavior. And if you look back on America's role in the world, uh, measuring power in terms of resources, uh, the United States becomes the largest economy in the world in about 1900, a little before that. In 1917, it tips the balance of power in Europe when Woodrow Wilson sends two, two million men to, into World War I. It then brings them home, uh, does not stay to replace Britain, which is too wounded to be able to continue to produce the global public goods uh, 
that are necessary for stability. It produces the 1930s, which is, as Auden put it, a low dishonest decade of genocide, of depression, and of war. And after 1945, a lesson is learned that we can't go home again. We leave troops overseas. Indeed, they're there to this day. What's interesting about the 2016 election in these terms is that while Americans have had deep disputes on foreign policy, Vietnam, Iraq, and so forth, this election is the first time that you've had the candidate of a major political party calling into question that basic post-45 consensus that we needed to stay allied, create networks, and essentially provide global public goods. Um, now, the question is, will Trump live up to those statements in the campaign, or will he back away from them? Uh, his meeting with Abe suggests that in Asia, at least, he may back away. We don't know what he's going to do in Europe or the relations with NATO and Putin and so forth. But if Trump does destroy the alliance and <coughs> institutional structure that was created to provide global public goods after 1945, then Bob's right. Then I will we'll have to have another edition of the book retracting a lot of what's in it. Um, so I'll leave that as an open question because none of us really know what Trump is going to do. And if anything, he's very, very unpredictable. So let's go back to the basic question that we could have asked before the 2016 election, and Bob suggested that we do that, not just look at 2016, which is the United States in decline. And there you want to distinguish between absolute decline and relative decline. Absolute decline essentially is what happened to ancient Rome where you had uh, – uh, not the rise of another empire that replaced the Romans, but uh, internecine warfare at home, no growth and productivity in the economy, and uh, uh, inability to manage barbarians. Uh, if you ask, is the United States like that in absolute decline, no matter what we think about our, the misery of this last election cycle in politics, the long-term trends in terms of basic resources are actually quite good. Uh, demography. UN demographers say the U.S. is the only country among rich countries that will maintain its position in the world in 2050. Today, it's in terms of population, it's uh, China, India, U.S. In 2050, it'll be India, China, U.S. And that's partly because of immigration, which I think, uh, if the polls are correct, uh, will continue despite Trump's efforts. If, uh, if you look at energy, uh, 10 years ago, we would have felt that we were hopelessly dependent on imported energy. Now the IEA sees North America as possibly energy independent in the next decade. If we look at uh, the major technologies of the 21st century, um, uh, biotech, nanotech, the next generation of information technology, it's pretty broadly agreed that the United States is the leading country in all three. And if you look at the underlying university structure, which produces ideas, um, Shanghai Jiao Tong University ranks universities every year. Of the top 20 universities that they list, 15 are in the United States. None are in China. So I would argue that shows that we're not in absolute decline. There are some power resources there which are trends are going in the right direction. But what about relative decline, which is you can be doing very well and others can be doing even better? And then you have to ask, all right, who is likely to replace us? Uh, Ten years ago, you might have said the European Union. That looks less likely now. The European Union has equivalent size in economy as the U.S., but lacks unity. Russia, Russia is a country which is in decline. And that makes them more dangerous because they're more risk acceptant and Putin is willing to take adventurous steps to make Russia great again. Um, I think that leads us really to China. And China is the economy of about $10 trillion, U.S. about $18 trillion. The argument that China's passed the U.S. already uh, is usually made in terms of purchasing price parity but you don't import jet engines or oil in purchasing power parity, you import it in exchange rates, currencies. 
And when there's been a game about when will China pass the U.S. It was very fashionable after the Great Recession when we were in the doldrums and China was growing with a major stimulus of 10% a year, that China would pass us in 2020. It, that was the date the economist gave, the London economist. Uh, now, with growth rates for China projected by people like Larry Summers and Lant Pritchett as more like 3.9% in the 20s, you get those numbers coming across each other in the 2040s. Uh, and uh, even then, you won't have equivalents in military power or in soft power. So I don't think China is going to pass the U.S. I think it's, uh, there's a tremendous tendency of what Martin Wolf called to treat them as a premature superpower, to take existing lines and project them indefinitely into the future. Not only is that a bad way to understand history, it misleads about what's going on in China. Demographically, China has a problem. They worry about getting old before they get rich. Politically, it has a problem. When countries reach about $10,000 per capita income, there are increased demands for participation. China is reaching that level and hasn't figured out how to manage participation. Uh, if you want to see more on this, look at David Shambaugh's book, or look at the book by Bob and my former student, Ming Sin Pei, which make a real case that politics is going to be what blocks China. You can also turn to environmental questions, but perhaps most important is China's development model, which Danny Roderick has talked about here at Weatherhead Center uh, uh, seminar a couple, few months ago, um, which has been based on globalization and exports. If globalization really is decline, that's really bad for China because they have been a major beneficiary. And the question of whether China can move from imitation to innovation and a development model which looks internally is that is the accepted conventional wisdom among Chinese economists. Efforts to do so run into extraordinary domestic political blockages. But in any case, it's, to my mind, an open question whether China is going to pass the U.S. in 2040s. Maybe. Maybe not, but this current view that, uh, that you see with Edward Luce, uh, that it's all in China's favor, not necessarily. But I think that's indeed less important, and this gets me to the central point where I think Bob and I agree. Uh, I argue in this book, Is the American Century Over, that I worry less about being passed by China than by what I call entropy. Entropy is the inability to get work done. There's a complexity that goes with the rise of non-state actors and fragmentation, which is making it a lot different for anybody to get anything done. And what that means is even before the 2016 election, election, before Trump, we were faced with a major problem is how did we maintain what Bob properly calls network centrality? Uh, we had created these networks for the post-45 period. It was going to be harder to maintain them in the future before Trump, and Trump just makes that whole problem worse. What I say in the book, uh, Is the American Century Over?, is not over, but it's going to look very, very different than it did in the past because it's going to have to deal with these problems of entropy. It would be a lot simpler if we only had to deal with the rise of China. In fact, we have to deal with the rise of everybody and everything. And that is why I think Bob and I, despite apparently disagreeing, wind up uh, in a large extent agreeing that institutions and regimes and regime complexes are going to be absolutely central. And whether we're going to be able to maintain those or not, I'm not sure. This is one of the reasons that my current work is taking me a lot into this question of developing a regime complex for cyber and the internet. And Fenn Hampson is here who, who had uh, helped to set up this uh, global commission on internet governance, which I participated in under Carl Bildt's leadership for two years. I think the interesting question there is if you look at something like the new regimes for uh, rules for the internet, you get to something which does look like what Bob said. We're not going to have, in my view, one internet. You already have a fragmented internet. 
China behind the Great Firewall has a different system. Uh, Russia has a very authoritarian system uh, behind its firewalls. Uh, but there still is connectivity despite that. And the interesting question is in the areas where we need to produce connectivity for economic purposes, can we maintain it? And can we maintain it in a way which doesn't allow conflict or cyber war? Uh, and that leads to the ability to develop rules. When she and Obama met last September, a year ago, they did agree on rules for limiting commercial espionage in cyberspace. So it's not true that gray areas can't have new rules, which the great powers agree upon. With that said, however, if you try to get agreement on content, for example, free speech on the internet, as Hillary Clinton put it in, in 2010, good luck. It's not going to happen. The Russians and the Chinese are just not going to allow that to happen. So we're going to wind up with regimes for in complex interdependence areas like cyber, which are very imperfect. And that ties very closely with what Bob said at the, at the end of his remarks. It's going to be, I think, possible for us to manage this but not if populism grows. If populism grows and if Trump repeats a 1930s type return toward inward attitudes, then I think uh, all bets are off and I'm gonna have to revise the book quite completely. Uh, if on the other hand, my remark earlier was correct, which is time is on our side, that populism is fueled by older white men like me, uh, and that I am not the future, or at least my age group or is not the future. Uh, and if we wind up with a situation where the American people do not turn inward and the Chicago Council poll is correct, then the situation may not be as dire as Bob uh, described. So whether Bob and Ed Luce are right, and I have to totally rewrite the book, or whether I can just uh, revise it slightly, I would submit it's still up in the air. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you so much to both of you for such a stimulating presentation and response. So we have a few minutes for uh, Q&A. Actually, we have half an hour, and I'll open it with Michael Sandel. And we are recording, so you have to speak in the mic. A question for Joe about another possible area of disagreement with Bob, not about decline in the American century, but about what struck me as, as Bob's mea culpa when he said, that global capitalism hijacked complex interdependence uh, when he said that uh, business and finance wrote the rules of global institutions and that the uh, defenders of globalization had uh, failed to attend sufficiently to this feature and uh, are therefore partly responsible for the populist backlash. Do you agree with Bob about that? Uh, partly, uh, and uh, there's a very nice Project Syndicate column by Danny Roderick, to quote him again, uh, saying economists have o oversold trade agreements and oversold uh, globalization. And I think uh, that means that uh, very often uh, things which were very important to business weren't very important to the ordinary citizen or ordinary worker. Uh, on TPP, for example, uh, whether it, if it had gone to a lame duck session and, and tried to pass it, uh, one of the big issues would have been how many years you'd get for biologics. And Senator Hatch was, I don't know, rigid on whether it was nine years or 12 years or something like this. The ordinary citizen couldn't care less. And so that kind of issue just took it away, away from things that uh, you could explain to to the ordinary citizen. And I think there is something in that uh, view. With that said, however, 
I think there's a great danger, and Bob and I actually wrote this in 2000, there's a great danger of identifying globalization with trade. Global, trade is one aspect of globalization. Globalization is also movement of people. There's also environmental globalization. The global warming we have is a form of globalization. It's not going away. If we stopped all trade, that wouldn't end. So we may wind up with the need for, and, or the cyber and the internet is a form of globalization. We will need regimes and rules to deal with the interdependencies of globalization, even if there's never another large-scale trade agreement. And I think these statements like Ed Luce's globalization is over, uh-uh, that's a very shallow kind of interpretation. Let me respond to, uh, uh, Michael, you're right, it was a mea culpa, and I want to push it a little harder. Uh, it seems to me that we, Joe, we didn't really do our full job as political scientists because we idealized the nature of American politics, uh, and we, we underestimated the grip on these issues that uh, economic elites had. And it was very dramatic in the Clinton administration, the Democratic administration, which was uh, the most gung-ho for some of these arrangements. BITS, for example, bilateral investment treaties, which have in general been disadvantageous, I, I would say, both to developing countries and to working class in the United States, but very helpful to the international capitalists. So I think, I think we really underestimated that. I think we a little, we're a little naive about saying, okay, complex interdependence, we can manage it. We, the, the we wasn't so clear. I mean, if we had been, man if you and I had been managing it, that would have been another story, but, <laughs> but we're not, at, at least I'm not in charge. You're, you're more closely advising, but you're not in charge either. And, uh, and it gives the, me something to do after retirement. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, make $10 billion, and then you'll have some influence. Brian <laughs> Meyer. Thank you. Charles Mayer, this is a wonderful exchange. Uh, uh, I... At the end of e each speech, I was persuaded by the respective speaker. Uh, my question is the following. Uh, there's a venerable tradition you know. It starts with Thucydides, and it goes up through Graham Allison, and there's a lot of commentators along the way, that in a period of power shifts, when one power senses it might be in decline, relative decline, uh, disputes are likely to escalate. War is more likely. Uh, I wonder whether you would, uh, and especially given a leader of unpredictable temperament and uh, reactions, uh, this is something uh, I personally worry about. Uh, I just wonder whether it, war and peace hasn't really entered, entered tangentially, I think, into the Joe's analysis. But would you speak more, uh, a little more fully about the possibilities of the danger of war? Might Trump mean war or might other leaders mean war? Could I t uh, comment on uh, just briefly and then turn to Bob? Um, Graham and I have argued this many times. Graham has brought up this, uh, has used the Thucydides example and then brought up some numbers of cases, and he says, I don't know, 12 out of 16 have led to war and so forth. They're not real cases. Those numbers are totally spurious, and I've told him this. No, but the, but the danger is that we think that there's something real there. Bob, uh, uh, Kagan, at the classicist at Yale, pointed out that Thucydides even may have gotten it wrong about the Peloponnesian War, <laughs> and, there's, and that the, basically the power of Athens had ceased to rise, and that there were a series of accidents that tended to produce the causation. But the point is, I, I think the danger of doing what Graham is doing, of making this the Thucydides trap as though it's some rigid thing, is it, it over-reifies it. I think the real danger is accident and miscalculation, and it doesn't necessarily have to do with the rise of China. I think the decline of Russia may be a greater source of accident and danger than the rise of China. After all, it was your Austrians in you know, 1914 who, who were the, the most risk acceptant of, of the lot. I worry about a Trump without any experience and with a, a difficult, with an emotional temperament reacting to something like the uh, Hainan Island incident where a Chinese jet collat, uh, collided with the American electronics investigation plane. Uh, it was managed in 2001 by Colin Powell and Rich Armitage who knew a lot. 
I don't know that Trump has going to have somebody about that. I don't think that has anything to do with the rise of China. I think it has to do with the temperament of the, of the leader. In general, I agree with that. Uh, I think that we have to ask, uh, if you ask about the rise of a, rise of a great power, uh, of a new great power, sometimes that has led to war or contributed to it. But it seems to me there are, usual, there are two conditions you should ask about. One is, is there a security dilemma, especially produced by an alliance structure? World War I is the classic example of that. Uh, where there's, a, there's an inclination of stronger powers to defend their weaker allies and there's a chain reaction? Or secondly, is there a, uh, is this new rising power bent on world domination? That was true of the Nazis, in my, opinion, in my view. But th I don't think either is likely to be true of China. So I don't see any inevitable cl U.S.-Chinese clash. China seems to me to be a country that very much wants to have a large sphere of influence in a large place in the world. They have no history of uh, grand external aggression. Uh, so I, I, and the U.S. and China are actually far away. My own, my own view is that Chinese have more reason to object to American policy than we have to object to Chinese policy. We objected to Russian policy when they put missiles in Cuba, uh, and we have a fleet in the, in the South China Sea, which is very, very close to China, so, and very far from us. So I, I could very well see an accommodation between the U.S. and China. It's not going to be good for human rights in Southeast Asia. Uh, but from a war point of view, I agree with Joe. There's a, uh, I don't like Lieutenant General Flynn. It seems to me he's entirely um, incapacitated by temperament and views to be national security advisor. So I, on this administration, I think there's a, there's a risk. But as a structural matter, I'm not, I'm not concerned about this. There's yeah. not. not Basic concern about it. This may be an unfair question, but there are some who say that it's uh, really technology that is uh, driving the uh, gale of creative destruction that is leading to uh, the new populism. It's not uh, free trade and open markets and some of the things that you know, Trump has uh, laid blame on for loss of American jobs. If you were to say, you know, which countries and which institutions are best equipped to ride that, that gale of creative destruction, as Schumpeter called it, um, you know, I would say, you know, the United States clearly is. It, it may give you Trump, but that's a, that's a short-term aberration in terms of the kind of innovations you talked about, Joe. Um, if you look at the Chinese and, and the kind of transformation that they want to bring about with uh, their digital plus uh, 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 economy uh, to go from manufacturing to high-tech uh, internet-based uh, uh, services um, and innovation, um, they're going to have a much harder time doing it, and it's going to be much more destructive in terms of their own political system because they're not going to be able to, to uh, have their cake and eat it. They're not going to be able to ride that wave and have the kind of repressive system they have in place now. So um, my question to you is on the technology side, institutionally, who is better equipped to ride that wave, notwithstanding it's enormously disruptive and it's filtering through the political system with various aberrations that we're seeing today. Uh, I think, uh, well, I may have been too influenced by my colleague Robert Lawrence, who's here, but uh, his argument has been that we blame trade for the loss of jobs when we should be blaming technological change. But if you're a politician, standing up and blaming technological trade doesn't aim you the votes that blaming a foreigner does. So I think that uh, I think I would say that uh, that explains part of this. But then you go back to this point of how much of the populism really is driven by the loss of jobs, and it's part of it, and how much of if it is driven by the loss of status. I think 
frankly, that the cultural issues and the loss of status are the stronger of the two. If, it's, if that's correct, and Robert Lawrence is correct, then this is something that the U.S. is well-placed to ride out. But I may be, Robert might be wrong, that's unlikely, but I might be wrong, that's, a, <laughs> that's much more likely. Well, I, what I worry about, though, I, I, don't, I would not have said that Trump is a short-term aberration. If Trump had no power to change the direction of history, he'd be a short-term aberration. If he had been elected mayor of uh, Chicago, populist platform, okay, he's a short-term aberration. Um, and, the, and maybe the fact, that, and if he'd come close to winning, but hadn't won this election, short-term aberration. The Nazis were losing, were losing support when they executed a coup d'etat and, and ended democracy. They were a short-term aberration. If you believe the polls, they were a short-term aberration. I don't believe that the President of the United States is a short-term aberration. You just simply say, okay, we'll let it ride. I'm much more worried than that. Catherine Sitkink. Uh, so I too, Bob, was uh, uh, noted your notion of global capitalism hijacking international institutions. But couldn't one argue, actually, that capitalism has hijacked those parts of globalization that are less governed by international institutions? For example, taxation and especially the combination of domestic tax law and tax havens. Or for example, the lack of regulation on corruption, finance, and banking, which are, again, less governed by international institutions. Um, or for investment, for that matter, the, the multilateral agreement on investment that never happened. And, and if that's the case, then I think the solution might not be less, you know, l losing confidence in international institutions, but thinking that we need more regulation in specific areas, using international politics to regulate corruption, to shut down tax havens, and to implement perhaps a Tobin tax on financial transactions. So, Catherine, that's the liberal agenda, but who's going to do it? I mean, in a, in a political system which is which was stagnating because there was no chance of achieving anything, <laughs> and which now Trump may or may not have, have the possibility of, of moving, moving backwards in this way. Uh, if you, there's not much variation in your analysis because, because global capitalism has dominated both areas like bilateral investment treaties uh, and, the, um, and the repeal of Glass-Steagall, the kind of neoliberal agenda. It's dominated both areas where there have been international agreements and where there haven't been. So, okay, but I, I, I rest my case. Mm -hmm. um, David Welsh, I'll tell you what I have. I have David Welsh, the new whose name I'm just forgetting, uh, Steve Walt, uh, Bill Kirby, uh, Carl Kaiser, uh, Melissa Williams, and Suzanne Berger. A so I'll ask a you to- Distinguished list of yes. questions. <laughs> and, okay, and Bob Putnam. So I'll ask you to try to keep your questions short so that it would be wonderful in the next 15 minutes we could hear from all these people. <laughs> it's a very nice group of people. Yes, I'd, uh, I'd just like to hearken back to your early collaborative work on transnational relations and world politics. And in the 70s, the takeaway seemed to be on balance, uh, trends were a, a net positive for global order. And I'm wondering if you uh, think it's changed um, in view of the new configurations of actors and the new ways in which actors interact transnationally. And what does that say about the possibility of American leadership in the future? It will kind of qu collect three questions at okay. the time, and then it will. Okay, I'm sorry. I apologize. I don't remember your name. Don't worry. I'm Joelle Jenny. Some have argued that Trump's unpredictability can actually act as a deterrent and therefore actually decrease the risk of conflict internationally. What's your perspective on that? Okay, hands down. Oh. Okay. Pardon me. Uh, this, was, this was terrific. I wanted to ask about the trade-off between the different elements of power, including the one that Bob emphasized about network centrality. Um, is it possible that the more you try to emphasize one element, for example, network centrality, that costs you in other areas, uh, for example, internal cohesion? Uh, with hindsight, 
that four to six trillion dollars we spent on Iraq might have been used to address economic inequality here at home and head off all of the points that Bob talked about and all of the downsides of globalization. Uh, you could argue that much of what the United States has done over the past 25 years or so has been to expand its network centrality, expanding NATO, getting involved in lots of other places. But it has led exactly to the phenomenon that we're worrying about now. And just one final point here. The last four presidents, as near as I can tell, all ran on platforms suggesting we should do less abroad and do more at home. Bill Clinton, it's the economy stupid. George Bush, a humble foreign policy. Barack Obama, nation building at home. And now Trump. Now the first three of those did not deliver on that particular promise for one reason or another. So my question to both of you would be, is it possible that the American century would last longer if we were a little less active abroad? Or to put it in different terms, how do we exert global leadership without constantly overdoing it? So uh, I'll, I'll start on taking uh, them in order just quickly, mostly on Steve's. Uh, I, I think that the transnational relations aspect, which is now uh, seen as non-state non actors, transgovernmental relations, and so on, is still positive. It, it diversifies uh, the number of actors in, in, in world politics. It gives, uh, uh, for example, as, as Catherine Sicking has emphasized, human rights coalitions the, act, uh, uh, the opportunity to act without going through states necessarily. So I'm still positive on that in general. Uh, I don't think that Trump plays a deterrent role and will decrease conflict uh, because we don't, we don't have a deterrent problem except for deterring Donald Trump. And uh, the, um, on Steve's trade-off, I, I think the answer to your question is selectivity. I was, as you, you and I were both strongly against the war in Vietnam. Uh, not all of our liberal, friend, liberal internationalist friends were. Uh, I think that you have to be very careful to be selective. But it's true. But, but Obama did deliver on this promise. It's not clear that it slowed down the rate of, of difficulty for the U.S., but he certainly delivered on, on the promise of pulling back from that, those kinds of activities. I think we have to maintain network centrality on those, uh, for those causes and issues where it's important to our welfare and our security. I don't think that includes uh, including Ukraine and NATO. Uh, I don't think it necessarily includes uh, having to be dominant in, in the South China Sea. Um, uh, I think there are some trade-offs. I'm, I'm, I'm becoming more and more of a defensive realist in my old age. Um. Progress. <laughs> 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 On uh, David's question about uh, optimism and the 1970s work that Bob and I did about transnational relations, um, I don't, I mean, it, you can look back and say there was a period of some optimism, but if one is really careful about the 1970s, remember we were still digging our way out of the miserable Vietnam imbroglio. You had the rise of terrorism and the, I mean, if you look at the table of contents of our book, you'll find terrorism, uh, transnational capitalism, I mean, there are, I don't know that we were that optimistic. I, I would sort of say some things are good, some things are bad. I don't know whether it's a linear uh, uh, progression. On Could Trump jolt the system? Possibly. I mean, if you take Trump's actions um, uh, on China, you could say that uh, if you're trying to get the Chinese to uh, we talked about this a little bit at lunch, uh, trying to get the Chinese to impose voluntary export restraints on steel rather than dumping steel, which might make jobs in Youngstown or something. And you also want to get the Chinese to give proper reciprocity on national treatment to American companies, where the Chinese now don't. They treat their companies better than, than they treat our companies. You could argue that Trump's game that he's been playing of taking a call from Tsai Ing-wen and then talking yesterday on television about uh, maybe rethinking one China policy uh, unless we got a better deal economically, it's possible that could lead to a deal. It's also possible that it could be <coughs> too risky. So I'm, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm not, uh, it, it, it's not my style, but, uh, but is it plausible or possible? Maybe. <laughs>
Um, now, on the question of Steve's question about, um, I don't think Iraq helped our network centrality. It hurt it. Our, we had deep divisions with our NATO allies over it. And uh, we had to coerce a lot of countries into being what were they called, uh, uh, you know, coalition of the, of the unwilling. And uh, uh, so I, th I read the lesson as not that you should stay home more, but you ought to stay out of trying to control the domestic politics of socially mobilizing countries, something Carl Deutsch pointed out a long time ago. It's a losing game. We lost it in Vietnam. We lost it in Iraq. And I, I, you and I have, are, if, if you interpret offshore balancing to mean you leave troops in Japan where they cost us almost nothing because the Japanese have host nation support, then you and I are in agreement. If your offshore balancing says cut the alliance with Japan, then we're in strong disagreement. But the main point is you're not going to solve that by a budgetary situation. The United States spends about 3.5% of its GDP on the military now. In the Cold War, that was 10%. If we wanted to spend more on the military without bankrupting ourselves, we could. But I think what you do is you pick your locations to places where American troops are wanted locally for maintaining a local balance of power. That's the case in East Asia. So if, if depending on how you interpret your offshore balancing with Japan in or out, we agree or disagree. How do you answer that? Oh, we agree on it. Okay. <laughs>